Ghana Society of Cardiology alarmed by the number of young persons reporting to facilities with stroke. A lot of heart attack. We get calls every now and then, people having heart attack. We'll bring you more on this. Plus, we are not deaf people. That's the cry of chiefs and people of the Adamurabi town in the eastern region of Ghana as they fight off that tag. Last President Ekufuado makes a strong case for the withdrawal of 30% of Ghana's public funds and assets deposited in foreign banks as he rallies other African countries to do the same in a bid to empower African banks and multilateral institutions. At the last count, more than 29,000 Palestinians have been slaughtered by Israel. Apologies for the wrong sound. Welcome to Joy News Desk. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. Do stay for details. Many thanks for your time. Unhealthy lifestyles and lack of exercise have been identified by the Ghana Society of Cardiology as the two major causes of stroke, mostly reported by younger persons at health facilities across the country. Concerned about this development, the society is intensifying its education on the need to be mindful about the foods consumed with an advocacy for regular checkups. Vice President of the Society, Dr. Francis Ejiko made this known at its annual general scientific meeting in Accra. Formerly, we used to say that terosclerosis cardiovascular disease is the disease of the rich countries, and thing, but now we are seeing a number of them. You can attest to the fact that you are hearing a lot of stroke cases on the walls. There was one time I was in a district hospital, like general hospital, a bed capacity of about 10 beds on the ward. Sometimes about six to eight of them are occupied by stroke patients. These days, we are seeing a lot of heart attack. We get calls every now and then, people having heart attack, we need to go and try to open the artery for them. And there are a lot of patients with other problems like impotence, kidney disease. Some of all of these are part of the problem. So it is a common problem. There was a study that was done in Kumasi to look at um, the atherosclerosis cardiovascular disease uh, on the wards. And over a period of 10 years, there had been more than 250% increase in the cases that were being admitted there. So that is a very common condition and it's increasing as well. We'll have a conversation on that shortly as uh, Dr. Francis Ejikum himself joins me. We'll also pick the thoughts of the Ghana Health Service shortly on this uh, important issue of staying healthy. But right now, let's talk about the first Deputy Speaker of Parliament, Joseph Oseuzu, who says Oseche Mensah Bonsu did not have to resign as majority leader to be able to serve as chairman of the NPP's manifesto committee. This has been offered as part of the reasons why the Swami legislator had to step aside. We'll hear from the first Deputy Speaker shortly. First, here is a report by Parliamentary Affairs Correspondent Kweku Asante capturing the response to the majority leader's resignation nation in parliament. The minority MPs believe Oseche Mensah the former majority leader, has been forced out. Today he came indeed to the floor of the house, first took a seat behind the chair that would ordinarily belong to him as majority leader. Later on in the day, though, he, he went there for like a minute and then left. But I'll say Chairman Sabonsu, in an exclusive interview with John News, tells me that he will be willing to break his silence on all this tomorrow. Leader, why didn't you take your seat? You took another seat today. <laughs> Leader, can you confirm officially that you told the president that you had resigned? 
Peter, can you tell us, join you something? That you've resigned officially. What is in the works now? I'll speak to you tomorrow. Okay, thank you, Peter. Leader! You just, you just want to get a confirmation. <laughs> Once a leader, always a leader. I tell you. Leader, I always. I'm telling you. Right. It's always a leader. Cobra. Leader, okay. NDC MPs really believe that he has been forced out. I get the sense that he was forced out. I got this information about a week ago that there was going to be some changes in the leadership and I actually spoke with Honorable Afenyo Markins. You know, myself and he is my very good friend. I asked him, uh, is it true that you be made the majority leader? And he said he's unaware of any of such moves. You know, they say that um, one of the important rules in any game is knowing when to walk away. And I think that um, time and experience, to a very large extent, uh, have tamed Osei Chimen Sabonsu. And even if there was an attempt to push him out, it is simply because he's been tamed. Well, majority MPs believe that there is no rancor within their side, and as far as they are concerned, all is calm. He uh, has been given a very important role. Drafting the uh, manifesto of um, Dr. Baumia, it's a very tedious work. And so he, it was going to be a bit difficult to combine the two. I mean, leading the majority and doing that. And so um, some of us are at peace that he voluntarily decided to give up the position so he can concentrate on this new one. But some believe that he was forced out. Well, I was in the meeting. Uh, he said it was voluntarily. We expect that the National Council of the New Patriotic Party will meet on Friday to finalize the decision on the resignation of State Chairman Sabunsu and announce his replacement. That replacement is expected to be his deputy, um, Alexander Afenyo Makin, who will now become the new uh, majority leader. There has also been some penciled appointments of other persons, including the chief whip, um, Frank Adodompre, who is said to become the deputy leader, as well as some promotions that will happen. And we expect that this communication will formally come before the House next week. Reporting for Joy News, Kweku Asante, Parliament House, Accra. Meanwhile, addressing journalists in Parliament, Jose also explained that Osei Chairman Sabonso had been offered the Manifesto Committee role, and even when that came, he still had not contemplated on resigning. Disappointed that the Che decided to stand down. He is being a fantastic leader, an extremely hardworking person, and I would have wished that he stayed on till the end. So did it come to you as a surprise? Yes, it did. But as to what got to him, I'm sure we better let him explain. Well, once he stood down, it means he's no longer the majority leader. But as to whether any change has happened or not, I don't have any information. Uh, I'm not aware that. Uh, any person has been either nominated or discussed or chosen by the side. The manifesto committee's suggestion or was made to him before he resigned. At that time, he had not contemplated resigning. So I don't think it would have caused any uh, defect in his work. As anybody of, who has been close to him knows, he's extremely hardworking and he can sit from morning to morning if there's work to be done. Jose Uso is not happy with the Speaker's interpretation of the standing orders on how leaders are appointed, uh, uh, matter, insisting it has even further confused matters in the House. I can't see how you can interpret standing orders of Parliament to bring in a party, which is not a member of parliament. That interpretation, I can't see where the basis of that. And for me, that is a confusion that has been thrown into the interpretation of the new standing orders by Mr. Speaker himself. I'm not sure you can call this an interpretation, because an interpretation comes about when there's disagreement as to the meaning of a particular clause or order. There was no such thing. 
I thought the Honourable Member for Tamale North was making a comment in jest. So, um, the Speaker's opinion could, should not and could not be called an interpretation. He's only offering an opinion, and that's why, if it were an interpretation, uh, I wouldn't have had the courage to, or even the opportunity to offer an alternative one. But as to opinions, his opinion is different from mine. As to the meaning of that, it's different from that of the Honorable uh, Atachian. Well, majority of constituents in the Swami constituency in the Ashanti region have thrown support behind the Member of Parliament, Jose Chairman Sabunsa's resignation from the position of majority leader. To them, he has served well in his role as leader of the majority caucus. Respondents tell Joy News the resignation will enable him to offer his best in Dr. Baumier's campaign for election 2024. He has been a, a minority leader for four years, I think and a majority leader for seven years, two months now. And for him to resign, we know what he can do. And any time you go to him, he say party first. Anything that will make our MPP party break the eight. That is what we have to really behind, not about any individual. So I think what he has done is the interest of the party. In Ghana, everybody knows that Honorable SHMS have served well as a member of parliament, as a majority leader, and served well both the NDC and the MPP. Even uh, the efforts that he had made at the parliament, it's good for him to resignate from the parliament house so that the party will just carry on to break the eight. He has resigned to save himself from disgrace. Some time ago, he was almost beaten at Swami magazine. He couldn't perform as MP and a majority leader. I think our MP wants to concentrate on his new role in Baumia's campaign. It is good. He's sacrificing for the party. Well, I've been joined by Vice President of the Society of Cardiology, Dr. Francis Ejekum, for a conversation on the fact that lifestyle and lack of exercises is a leading uh, cause of stroke in young persons these days. Grateful for your time, Doc. First, let's break it down. What kind of lifestyles are leading to these cardiovascular diseases? Hello, Doc. Well, well, we just uh, lost Dr. Francis Ajikum there. He's a vice president of the Society of Cardiology. Uh, he will be talking to us more about the reason why uh, lack of exercise and unhealthy lifestyles are leading causes of stroke uh, of from young people who are uh, reporting at our health facilities these days. Well, before we do that conversation, let's listen from a few of you we spoke to on the streets of Accra. A normal exercise, one of the station, um, from 5 uh, uh, a.m. to, to 5.30. I normal that my exercise join them and Saturdays I go jogging. I don't take pizza, those food I don't take because where me, myself, I brought up from, we don't take those things, so I take my 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 normal banku and 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 plantain, kuku yam, yam, all those things. That's what I, I normally take. When I wake up in the morning, I don't actually take those um, light foods in the morning. I just take something like rice, banku, and those stuff. It's not like um, breakfast in the morning here. Yeah. Those banku and those stuff, yeah, heavy food. So it take you up to I think the middle of the day, then you get something like gary soakings or those stuffs to eat, yeah. Okay, so I think in the evening mostly we eat fufu. Yeah, that's all for the day. Normally, uh, instead of three times, sometimes I take, uh, I eat twice a day. 
in the morning, I make sure that I take uh, something heavy, like nine o'clock going, uh, like maybe beans and gari or kinky, so that it can sustain me well. Because if I take tea and cocoa, within a short time, I'll get hungry. Because of my work schedule, I don't have time for the gym. But my daily routine, like walking, house chores, is also an exercise for me. I can't remember the time I actually went for a general checkup. I used to go to the gym also, but then for some reasons I couldn't stop. I couldn't go, I stopped, yeah. Well, Dr. Francis Ejekum has joined us back. He's the Vice President of the Society of Cardiology of Ghana. Grateful for your time. I wanted a breakdown of what really we're talking about. Lifestyles, what kind of unhealthy lifestyles are leading to these cardiovascular diseases, Doc? All right. Thank you. Good morning once again. So when we talk about lifestyle problems or lifestyle, they are the behavioral risk factors that can lead to cardiovascular disease, the way we eat. So unhealthy eating habits. Um, people take to eating the wrong things, fatty food, deep fried food, and so forth. People eating late in the night, not getting enough time to use the food before they go to bed. All these leads to um, problems for us then. Smoking is also another problem. Uh, on healthy lifestyle, then exercise, like lack of exercise. There are a lot of us who don't like exercising. Um, we sit in our cars, we go back to the home and we sit behind the seating. So all these are problems that lead to the intermediate risk factors. These intermediate risk factors are hypertension, diabetes, cholesterol problems, obesity, but they generally result from our lifestyle and eventually lead to the cardiovascular diseases, most commonly stroke and heart attack. Well, you say mostly young people are the ones reporting to the health facilities with these diseases. Let's look at the uh, age range, I mean, the people who are reporting with these cases. We have seen, I mean, if you compare Ghana to the other countries, if you go to US and UK, you tend to, the people representing with this diseases tend to be in their 70s and 80s. But in Ghana, we are seeing quite a number of people in the productive age group, um, 40 years, between 40 years and 60 years, and indeed, quite a number of them below 40 years. My youngest patient who came with heart attack was at 27 years, and this is uh, too early uh, for people to be presenting with heart attack. That is also one of the reasons why, as a society, we are getting worried and need to educate people about it. Well, the, the other problem is that, I mean, everything comes at a cost. Eating healthy, for example, you need about 50 cities to 200 cities to get a healthy meal. How many young people can afford that? Again, the simple exercises we're even talking about, that's even if you don't have to go to the gym, you definitely have to sacrifice either to work early to be able to at least get some exercise or sacrifice your sleep to get exercise and still report at work early. How do we balance this? I mean, it's quite difficult. Yeah, though. It, it is, but you know, when you see health as an asset, then whatever you need to do to protect your health is important. We, a number of them have cars. You take your car to the mechanic. Uh, even when the car doesn't have a problem, you go and do servicing. So what we are saying, and that was about five years ago, we started preaching this, incorporate physical activity into your daily habits. When you wake up in the morning, you go, go to wash your car or do something, you can't do it yourself. When you get to your workplace, if your office is on the fourth floor or third floor, instead of taking the lift, you could walk the stairs during the lunch time. Instead of sending somebody to go and buy you food, you could walk there yourself. So you try to incorporate these activities into your lifestyle. You don't need to go and pay money in a gym before you can exercise. If your house is 
I mean, big enough, you can also exercise there. And all these are very good activities. When it comes to the diet, sometimes you even find that some of these junk foods are more expensive than when you take time to prepare your food. If you have a backyard, you can prepare some of these um, vegetables and things there and have them for yourself. So I think taking active steps for your health is something we all need to learn and do. Your society is on a sensitization drive to help deal with this challenge. What's the plan? So the plan is we started about five years ago and we are keeping to that. Uh, we, this year we are going to do more education. We need the media to also be involved in this so that when we say it is you, the media, who can propagate the message. Last year we had a screening program for uh, about five different uh, places in Ghana. This year we will continue with that to screen people because part of the prevention is also to detect them and eat. So as we educate people to eat healthy, those who already have it, we detect it early and be able to manage them well. So this is something we are going to do. In May, it's the May uh, attention month, May measurement month. We are going to be doing some screening for people, detect it early and help them to manage it well. The Electoral Commission uh, will be also, uh, we'll be talking about the Electoral Commission shortly, but Dr. Francis um, Abuja, I'm grateful for your time and the advice is for people to live healthy lives, uh, eat healthy foods and actually take good care of themselves by also exercising. Thank you so much. Uh, Francis Abuja is the Vice President of the Ghana Society of uh, cardiology. Now let's get to the electoral commission because it has admonished political parties to deploy effective party agents to represent them during the December 7 presidential and parliamentary elections to foster transparency in the polls. Ashanti Regional Director of the EC, Benjamin Barnabu, says the commission is putting in place measures to ensure a transparent electoral process that reflects the desires of the voters. Speaking at the launch of an electoral dashboard created by experts from the KNUST. He notes the EC's efforts must be complemented by political parties. The electoral dashboard created by experts from the KNUST's Faculty of Social Science is a comprehensive and intuitive platform designed to provide real-time insights into electoral data, ensuring transparency and informed decision-making during elections. It combines advanced data visualization techniques, geographical mapping and demographic analysis to offer a holistic view of electoral processes. Ashanti Regional Boss of the Electoral Commission, Benjamin Banner, Bill appreciated the efforts of the university in helping the commission to conduct a transparent election. This is a very innovative research and is going to enhance the work of the electoral commission to a very high level. You know, a lesson is about information, is about transparency, about fairness. You can do all things, but if you don't showcase it, people will not know what is happening. With this, uh, Electoral dashboard. It is going to be a one shop for all information relating to elections. It is going to make our work more transparent and it's also going to show the level of integrity in our system. Mr. Banobio called on political parties to contribute to the effort in ensuring a transparent election by deploying effective and efficient agents to various polling stations during the elections. My work for the political parties is that please trust the electoral commission and the system. Get actively involved. Engage effective party agents, not just anyone who can talk effective party agent who knows what he's doing so that you'll be able to differentiate between 66 and 99 so they will be able to stand up for the interest of his party or his candidate and then let them follow due processes if they are anything they think is going they are going on 
against the rules and regulations. They should draw the attention of the officials there. And it will be explained to him if they check and it is so, the corrective measures will be taken. We are not hiding anything from anybody. What we want to do as a commission, to organize an election in a very free, fair, and incontrovertible manner. So that in the end, whoever lost will know that, yes, I did my best, but I lost genuinely. Research lead on the project Gift Dumada says the electoral dashboard will contribute to Ghana's long-standing democratic status. The electoral dashboard that we've developed, uh, it's a service that we really wanted to offer to the Ghanaian uh, public. We felt that by giving information to the Ghanaian public will stimulate uh, participation. And if for our country we have a lot of participation in our electoral process, that will provide transparency and also enhance the legitimacy of our election that we carry out in general. And what we have, the, the online electoral dashboard that we've provided, is to help with our conversation. And we understand that this is just the beginning. It's a start of a larger conversation. And we are very fortunate that the stakeholders are here to play their parts in terms of providing their inputs to make it better. For Joe News, Nana Bwache Dankwe Yadom, Kumasi. Political scientist and CDD fellow, um, Dr. Osai Kwapon, uh, is actually raising concerns over the economic ideas and policies proposed by the major political parties, NDC and MPP, going into the 2024 elections. A recent analysis by the CDD suggests that these ideas may struggle to produce desired outcomes, especially in the face of current governance challenges. According to Dr. Osain Kwapon of the CDD, the ongoing campaigns have also failed to adequately address democratic regressions to represent the sentiments of the electorates and highlight the need for substantive ideas to lead the country towards a more solid path of economic growth. You know, based on my analysis of the Afrobarometer data and most recently our performance on the Economic Intelligence Unit's uh, Democracy Index, what the point I'm trying to make is that the economic issues are very important, right? I mean, Ghanaians would uh, agree that we face some major economic pinch points over the last several years. And so it's good that the, you know, the political parties, but mainly our two main candidates, are proposing ideas on how to fix the economy. But in an environment where there are also governance challenges, where citizens are having increasing mistrust in institutions or increasing perceptions of corruption or feeling like their leaders don't really um, listen to much of what they have to say, then those economic issues and challenges, as you are trying to address them in an environment of governance challenges, you would not reap the full benefits of it. That is why I'm arguing that you also need to pay attention to the good governance so, issues. So are, you, are you in essence saying that at the moment, Ghanaians are not listening or they are not resonating with the economic programs and ideas that these two major political parties are, are propagating? No, I think what I'm saying is that one of the challenges identified in Afrobarometer is the perception that Ghanaians feel their leaders don't listen. That's one of the questions in the Afrobarometer survey. You see, and so the point I'm trying to make is that... Uh, At the moment, we've heard from the NDC and MPP, they are talking about economic plans and economic programs they want to roll out. Does that mean that this is likely to hit a snack? It's not that it's likely to hit a snack, but I think if they want, if they get elected and they want to reap the full benefits of their economic programs, then they also have to make sure that they are addressing some of these key governance issues, right? So if you want to implement a policy, for example, but you have weak institutions, you won't get the full benefits of that key economic program in an environment of weak institutions. What should, what should be their focus now? I think their focus has to be both, right? So talk about the economic issues, but also talk about the governance issues as well. The weak institutions, the mistrust in, in institutions, uh, the perceptions that we don't really trust our institutions that much, um, you know, the fact that we don't feel like uh, the key 
you know, the key policy priorities that we have are not being addressed satisfactorily. Those are the things that I think they have to incorporate as part of the economic arguments that they are also making. Well, the governing MPP, after a high-level emergency meeting this morning, is heading to Parliament to officially communicate the party's decision to the Speaker on the reshuffle in leadership of the majority in the House. Samuel Mbora is at the Eliza Hotel, where this meeting has just ended. He joins us with more Mbora. What more can you tell us about this meeting? Right, so um, the meeting concluded with a unanimous decision from the National Council, which is the second highest decision-taking body of the party. After um, the, the current leader of uh, parliament within the majority, Jose Chairman Sabonsu, voluntarily tendered in his resignation. So we are fortunate to have the national organizer, Nana Bwachi Yadam, to give us details of what transpired. Nana, you are live on uh, the Joy News channel. Uh, tell us, um, how, how, how urgent was this meeting? For the party oh it was very urgent i mean um that is the reason why we called for this emergency meeting to consider the reconstruction of the party's leadership in parliament um a lot of consensus building consultation went on before this particular meeting uh, his excellency the president met the entire majority caucus on wednesday uh, before that, the national leadership, the national chairman, general secretary had also met with the um, caucus. And just today, um, a meeting was convened at the instance of the majority leader, the, 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 the outgone majority leader, Honorable Chairman Sabunsu, where again, MPs, majority caucus uh, were also present and um, nominations were made for approval by national council. I can uh, say that National Council has approved um, the following names for to constitute the leadership of Parliament. Honorable Alexander Afenyo Marken will be our new majority leader. Um, we know the experience he's coming with. He's a very dedicated, sharp, committed, intelligent young man, and he's taking over from. He's, I mean, this is a huge shoes. Honorable Chairman Sabonzu um, has commitment and his uh, intellect when it comes to parliamentary duties will be celebrated not only in Ghana but across the globe. Um, so Honorable Afenyo Marken will take his place as the new majority leader. And then we have another affable lady, um, mother for all, very welcoming, very warm person, Honorable Patricia Apeje, um, who is the MP for Asokwa will be the deputy majority leader. We have the chief whip. Uh, it is still Honorable Anodon Prayer, who is the MP for Nsawam Adwejri. Honorable Patricia Peje is the MP for Asokwa. Um, we have um, Honorable Alexander Fenyomakin, MP for Efutu. And then um, we again, the de first deputy whip will be the MP for um, Tolon, Honorable Habib Idrisu will be, will still be, in fact, he used to be the first deputy um, or first um, deputy speaker, uh, sorry. And then we have another new face, a new addition in the person of the MP um, for Akontomra, Honorable Alex Tete uh, Junubua, will be the second deputy whip. So this is the new um, approved leadership of the majority caucus in parliament. Um, so an official the, the, statement. Yeah, yeah the, the question is why? Why was it there the need for you to reconstruct parliament? Is there any special reason aside what we are hearing in the rumors that the uh, current or the outgoing majority leader was somehow forced? You heard the minority in parliament saying that he was ousted from his position. Why? Why did you actually have to reconstitute this team? No, he was not ousted. You notice that he voluntarily stepped down from his position. Now he's taking another important um, 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 position. Now he is the chairman for MPP's manifesto committee. And again, he will still be the minister in charge of parliamentary affairs. So um, for us, uh, that is okay. It's a new mandate. I mean, 
change is good. We have consensus building on this particular matter, and he's still there. The, although he is not contesting again, his experience is still there for everybody to tap in. For us, he served the country well, he served parliament very well, he served uh, the party very well, and he will continue to do so. There is still energy in him. Um, as I said, I would even always advocate that he start writing a book. I mean, he will be celebrated uh, for the work that he's done. So it was out of pure consensus building. All right, we know there will be an official statement from the General Secretary. Exactly. We, I also understand he's headed to Parliament with some of the party bigwigs to officially communicate to the Speaker of Parliament. Exactly. But before this um, official confirmation and approval by the National Council, we, we already had the names roaming on social media and it appears there was some level of discontent even within the majority in parliament. Why did they have to get to that level? How come these names leaked? Oh, I mean, I mean you, are, you, are, you are in the media space. I mean, as for some of these names leaking, I think that it is part of the job we do. Sometimes you can have some of these names leaking. But the most important thing is that, yes, some people may not be happy with one or two decisions but what is important is that we have had deep detailed consensus building right from tuesday up to today friday and as i speak i can confidently tell you that i was in parliament this morning um, where the majority caucus met and you could see that they, they met with that spirit of consensus building so for us as a new patriotic party as we took this decision that is why we took our time before arriving at this decision we have a consensus building everybody is okay with the new leadership and we are going to have participatory leadership in parliament right, now that we know the final leg of your reorganization towards the election has to be with your running mate this emergency meeting did you did that conversation come up or you you still jettison that you are still scouting for um, someone to partner Dr. Mahmoud Baumia? Oh, I, I believe that the energy and the enthusiasm with which His Excellency, the Vice President, the leader of the New Patriotic Party, is carrying out his mandate as the flag bearer of the New Patriotic Party. I'm sure uh, in no time we will hear the name very, I mean, in no time. How soon? Oh, very soon. I don't want to give timelines because he is the leader of the party. Um, recently he came, he appeared before National Council and requested for just some time to do more detailed and deep consultation. So we are okay. But then if you consider how he's, com uh, he's put together his campaign team, how he's put together the manifesto uh, committee and how he's working recently, he spoke to the nation about his vision. I am very certain that um, you, very soon he's going to... Are you considering a religious leader to partner him? We've had recent names like uh, Reverend Opokuina coming up strongly and all that. Is the party considering someone who is from the um, leadership of um, the religious bodies in the country? I, I don't know what you are talking about. Um, what I know is that His Excellency, the Vice President, in no time will put before National Council his nominee to partner him uh, as the vice presidential candidate. I don't know what you are talking about. All right. Thank you very much, my brother. You had uh, Nana Bwachi Adam. He is the the national organizer of the governing new patriotic party talking to us here live from the alisa hotel where the national council uh, of the npp the highest or uh, the second highest decision making body of the party has concluded with the unanimous decision that the names as presented or being read out in the media to constitute the new leadership in the majority in parliament have been approved so the general secretary is leading the party today Parliament now to officially communicate to the Speaker of Parliament. So Aisha, that is the development from the Alisa Hotel there and the meeting has officially come to an end. If you don't have further questions for me, I'll hand it over back to you in the studio for the rest of the bulletin. Lisa Hotel, where this crunch meeting was held. He says they're heading towards Parliament to communicate to Parliament's speaker of the new changes in leadership. We'll be hearing more from Parliament when our correspondent, Kukwa Sante, joins us. Right now, the Palestinian Solidarity Movement in Ghana is asking President Ekofuado to speak against the injustice being meted out to Palestinians living on the Gaza Strip in the Middle East. The International Court of Justice is currently hearing a case brought before it by South Africa, which the country is accusing Israelis of genocide in the latest war against the Hamas terrorist group. Uh, 
However, in a bit to show solidarity, some Ghanaians uh, working under the Palestinian Solidarity Movement say Ghana's voice must be heard on what they describe as injustice. Leadership of the group have this uh, morning presented a petition to the United Nations office and calling on President Ekofuado to act immediately. At the last count, more than 29,000 Palestinians have been slaughtered by Israel, most of them women and children. More shocking is the fact that all these atrocities that are being committed by the Israelis on the Palestinian people is happening under the glaring watch of the United Nations. All the resolutions that has been brought to the United Nations in an attempt to compel Israel to cease fire has been vetoed by the United States of America. The Socialist Movement of Ghana and the Palestinian Solidarity Campaign is demanding that the United Nations uphold its founding principles, the sovereign equality and the rights of people to self-determination, to maintain international peace and security. The United Nations cannot forget the circumstances under which Israel was founded in 1948, just three years after its own formation. It is evident that Israel has lost it in the people's camp with the massive demonstrations all over the world in solidarity with Palestinian people, women's movement, youth camps, political formations, and the wave of popular and mass resentment to Israel's atrocities in Gaza. The United Nations must act beyond the solidarity statement occasionally made by Antonio Guterres. We and the People's Camp are at a loss how the United Nations is mute after the historic preliminary reliefs issued by the International Court of Justice declaring that Israel's actions in Gaza amounts to clear acts of genocide. The UN must not be seen taking a posture of neutrality in a clear act of genocide. It must play a leading role in demanding justice for the Palestinian people, and it must not allow itself to become a stooge to the United States of America. The people are watching you today closely, and if the United Nations must continue to be relevant, we must be seen to be equal players in it. Our demands are as follows. One, impose a two-way military security embargo on Israel work to adopt a mandatory arms embargo on it at the United Nations and adopt other punitive measures to prevent and suppress its acts of genocide and end the provision of economic and diplomatic support to Israel. Impose lawful and proportionate economic sanctions and other countermeasures on Israel, including cancelling all free trade and cooperation agreements until it fully adheres to its obligations under international law. We are not deaf people. That's the cry of chiefs and people of uh, Adumrabo town. The town in the eastern region which serves as a link between Ibri and OUB is known to be the home of deaf people who have unique ways of doing things. But is this really the case? Story News' Adobe Asari has more in this report. The Adumrabo town is sandwiched between Ibri and OUB. The town, over the years, has been known by many as the Deaf Village. Many stories have been told about the uniqueness of this town because it was believed to have majority of its populace to be deaf people who had their own ways of doing things. But the narrative seems to be quite different from the reality. The community folks say what is widely known and believed by people is not really the case. Some chiefs of the town express their displeasure 
in being exploited for stories and being called the deaf village. Se obey una makasa meti wote na makana anti sa akura na ayo nyame abode kuro bi anu amunfu ya de wonu mumu eh anti sa na ayo nyame abode no sa na ebi suabe puye ya hwan ma waye ma kuma kuma na mumu wakasa wodugwe kuro no wufi na anti sa sebi enna me mpanfu di kankan fo bi anu amunfu ni o ko bi wa mumu anti en chese kuro nu ye mumufu ne wa de bi ba ma kuma ku bi wa en ni fry kura no no onyame zo no ye o stifu o anti asem kuro onyame zo no ye e wo e mo se hu matu su bi bi wo no me me wira fi wo anka ma gba text na ya kan kan wo anti mumufu no e onyame satan adwuma anti e wo mumufu na wo kuro bi aso wo amane tu ai anya se ye nkuro nkuto ne bi wo or you be a boo, do do a boo, new one, he found you for Sarah Mabra for Cra, Mufu, or Ho. And tell ya young crew and Mufu. A war catch and go for a war for foreign say. She crew a war had now crew between ye between just as see any school square, you will school six. Ah, almost am called Fuku school, Niadi, and just say a moon for visiting one for school. Oh, now some move for to me because we to make sure we move for school. We will move for school. We will move A few town folk also express their disappointment in the perception people have had about them. We'll take a break on Joy News Desk when we return. There's more. My name is Daryl Kwao, Chief of Party at USAID Feed the Future Project. Dr. Victor Entry is calling on agribusinesses to tap into funds available for smart food production in Ghana. The funds are expected to support small businesses in the sector to create sustainable models at meeting the sustainable development goals. According to Dr. Entry, the USAID is available to support any viable business idea. He spoke to Joy Business at the final day of the Climate Financing Conference in Accra. The three-day conference highlighted some opportunities available for players in the climate change and agribusiness space. This is geared towards promoting food security in a sustainable economy. According to the chief party of the U.S. Aid Feed the Future project, Dr. Victor Entry, climate-friendly Ghanaian businesses have the advantage to apply for funds to support their growth. He believes that this will reduce the operational cost for the move towards climate change. As we speak, the Ghana government has Minister of Finance as the national designated authority for the Green Fund, the Green Climate Fund. So they've facilitated over $700 million. But the thing is, how many businesses know that they can access these funds to invest in mitigation and adaptation mechanisms. So this conference is very, very important for them to know that even you can ask access to carbon credit, which is currently um, one of the avenues of generating funds. We have a lot of business who are using um, solar panels. There are others who are also producing a lot of uh, tree crops. We are talking about agroforestry. Major partner of the event, PolicyLink, believes that most of the country's policies on food production are outdated and need some review. Country lead at PolicyLink, Yunus Abdullahi, told Joy Business that efforts are ongoing to review some regulations in the sector. We work with the Minister of Food and Agriculture to revise uh, the country uh, uh, national uh, Climate Smart Agriculture and Food Security Action Plan. This was a plan that was developed like way back in 2016, uh, and it was supposed to be implemented up to 2020. And currently, we're working with the ministry and key actors to revise the plan because there have been new emerging issues around climate smart agriculture that needs to be incorporated into the plan. And Policy Link is working with the government and actors to, to incorporate these emerging technologies and practices that will ensure that smallholder farmers are climate resilient. 
The theme for the conference is mobilizing resources for adaptation and mitigation. All right, and that's it for this segment. There's more news on our website, myjournaline.com forward slash business. The news continues after this break. About the blessing this morning, log on to myjournaline.com. There's more of the news and updates of all the developing stories. My name is Aishi Brian. See you again at 12.